done his PhD in Finland, and when I heard that, I asked him, is it on ICA? Because there is a big ICA group in Finland, traditionally. But it wasn't on ICA, it was on Boltzmann machine, on restricted Boltzmann machine. So the first papers on Boltzmann machine was published around 85, and the first author is Dave Ackley. Dave Ackley is now a professor at computer science department. And when we, so we just like found out it, okay, he's there, uh, let's stop by. We had an allocated time from lunch to the talk, and we stopped by, and he was there at the office hours, and we spent about 30 minutes or more talking after we realized, oh, it's just 15 minutes before the talk, we need to run here. So sorry about being late. We were, we were talking with the author of the first paper on deep Blossom machine. But now Kim Yun is working in University of Montreal on machine translation. And uh, I got very interested uh, after seeing his presentation, his demo at Neural Information Processing System this December, because they were mapping one language to another, sentence uh, in French to sentence in English and vice versa, and also showing which words from one language or one sentence correspond to which words in another language with what likelihood. So think about multimodal fusion about measuring e electroencephalography, say, and uh, functional MRI about the brain. Do they measure the same words, quote unquote, the same language or not? Can we find the words that map one to one, like the same phenomena? Can we find the words that don't exist in one but exist in another? That was my excitement, and we like that. There are about three or four people here who are working on this right now, and uh, let me uh, welcome Kenyon Cho and the Thank you. So, so unfortunately, Sergey told you everything about what I'm going to tell you. So it's going to be a bit boring. But the, Sergey invited me in a just right timing. So I had some interviews at some other universities. So I've been pre practicing this talk like five five times. Your job in interviews. Yeah, job interviews. So I can tell you, I can give really good presentation this time. The, as Sergey introduced me, I'm at the University of Montreal, but I don't speak French, and I'll give, I'll give every slide uh, presentation in English. <laughs> so, for instance, so I decided, I thought I was going to go in time, like chronological order, so I'm going to tell you about the present, and then what's the challenges, and if the challenges are all solved, what's going to be the future that we are going to do, but I decided at the last moment to actually go from the present, and then the really bright future. And then the challenges at the end. Just a few slides. So may I ask who actually uses, let's say, machine learning methods here in your, let's say, everyday life or you know, for your job? OK, about a third. All right, that's good. So I'll talk about machine learning first. And machine learning is the extremely simple and elegant field. And the whole machine learning can be explained by this single figure. If I can get some kind of data there. So we have a certain natural phenomenon. And an expert or scientist observes the natural phenomenon and builds so called domain knowledge. So that's the usual way of how the science is done. But at the same time, we can collect the data from the natural phenomenon. And the data is filtered using the domain knowledge, which is often incomplete. And it's transformed into a set of features. So we have the observations about the natural phenomena, and that observation is summarized, or the, uh, transformed into a set of features. And given these set of features, we apply the machine learning algorithms, such as classifier, regressor, to answer the questions about the natural phenomena. So this is the whole picture of the machine learning. And then one of the most important characteristics of the, this kind of, I'll call it traditional way, but it's still being used, so it's, I'll just call it traditional for now. So traditional way of machine learning, the characteristic is that there is a clear separation between the domain knowledge and actual machine learning. So only when the domain experts filters the data, the machine learning comes in. So that's the traditional way of doing machine learning. But that was going on well until about 2012, when something really unexpected, and I'd like to call it very deep, happened. So there is something called uh, uh, ImageNet challenge. In that challenge, the goal is to build a classifier 
that's going to take as the input an image and classify that image into one of the 1,000 categories. And they provide a training set of more than 1 million annotated images. And then when I looked at the top rankers in 2012, these are the usual gangs. So they are the top computer vision research labs in the world, like Oxford, INRIA in France, University of Amsterdam, ISS, I ISI is probably UC, yeah, USC, but I'm not sure actually. <laughs> but these are all usual gangs, and they use the, all the same methodology, following the traditional machine learning. So they get the features from images, and they fuse those, a lot of different types of features using so-called feature vectors, and then on top of that, use a very simple linear classifier, or the SPM. And they were like doing very well, except that the actual the top ranker was a team called Supervision from the University of Toronto, where they never really did the serious computer vision. What they did was just build a very large convolutional neural net that is going to take as the input the raw pixels of the images. And then after the feed forward pass in the neural net, that's going to just answer, okay, this belongs to this category out of 1,000. And this was actually done by Yalas Krzyzewski in his dorm room using one computer with two GPUs. And he trained the model for about two weeks. Of course, coding took about three months for him, I heard. But anyway, two weeks, and then it was getting much better performance than the, all the other, let's say, traditionally strong computer vision labs. And then the difference, this is the accuracy, and lower the better, is quite large. And from then on, everyone started using deep neural net to whatever they are doing. So for instance, I myself have tried the deep, deep neural nets or the deep learning onto the natural language processing. And we are doing better than the existing models on translation. And Jack Clinton and Alex Graves, Graves and all those other people have applied the deep learning to speech recognition. And if you have a smartphone, which I believe all of you do, you're essentially using the speech recognizer based on the deep neural net already. And then face recognition, no wonder Facebook is amazing at spotting the tagging, automatically tagging the friend's face in the picture. And often it's better than that, better than myself or the yourself, because they use, again, deep neural networks to do the face identification. Emotional recognition is really working well now. Human pose estimation. There's an image, image or video caption generation. And some people use it for the particle physics. And few people started using it for the bioinformatics as well. And they are all reporting a quite substantial improvement in the whatever the task they are trying to do. And actually, so okay, let's look at this. Sir. The most important characteristics, clear separation between the domain knowledge and machine learning. But this is not what machine learning researchers want. This is what the domain experts want. Machine learning researchers do not want this clear separation. What we really want is that the, we want to let the data, as it is, the data should decide everything. So we push the, so deep learning, we push the boundary of the machine learning all the way to the raw data. So we don't want the domain knowledge, okay, not that we don't want the domain knowledge, but we would like to have an access to the as raw data as possible before being filtered by the domain experts. But does that mean that the domain knowledge is completely out of the, let's say, game? No, that's not true. And that domain knowledge should come in as a structure of the actual model. So we build the structure based on the domain knowledge, and then we're going to feed the raw data into the model and tune the whole thing. And the model, based on the data, is going to decide what is useful or not automatically. And that's what we want, and deep learning is actually realizing this dream of machine learning research. And the really nice thing about deep learning is that it's not rocket science. I'll just give you the three-step recipe to do deep learning. And you can just follow this recipe, and then you can just do it already from tomorrow, after downloading like a few libraries. So first step is to, you need to prepare a very powerful, flexible, and end-to-end -end trainable computational model, such as the neural networks. But it doesn't really have to be even the artificial neural network. Whatever the nonlinear function approximator you can think. And then once that is prepared, you feed a lot of data into the model to perform certain tasks. 
And then the third step is that there is no step three. That's it. So you just do first and the second step, and it, it, it is going to solve quite a lot of problems you have. And let me illustrate this with an example of my recent work on the using neural net to do the machine translation. And I call it neural machine translation. I started calling it neural machine translation from last summer, and then somehow it caught people's attention, and everyone is calling neural machine translation these days, without knowing that I started it. Yeah. But well, so statistical machine translation is a very elegant problem, and then it actually is a one specific case of the almost every single machine learning problem we can think of. It's a simple sequence to sequence mapping problem, where you want to build a machinery that's going to learn to map from one sentence in one source language to the corresponding sentence in a target language by looking at the existing corpora of text. It's a very elegant and a lot of problems can be cast into this frame. Let's say mind reading kind of thing, right? So you look at the brain activities, that's going to be your source language, and the target is going to be the text, what you, your thought. And actually, people started doing that, but I'll get to that later. And in the ideal world, it's a really nice, elegant framework, is that the, this problem can be thought as learning, uh, max, maximizing the probability of the correct translation, given the source sentence, which can be decomposed into the so-called translation model and language model via base. So this is going to be the most difficult method I'm going to use today. The reason why we do this decomposition is that the language model in part can be tuned on the almost infinite amount of the monolingual corpus. So you can essentially grab, scroll the web, and then you can fit this language model. And we are going to fit the translation model using the much limited set of the sentence aligned bilingual corpus. Well, we do have a lot of them, but it's still much smaller than the monolingual corpus. And you, if you buy this statistical machine translation textbook, this is up to like the half of the first chapter or the, you know, at the end of the first chapter. And this is amazingly elegant, right? So we use probability, we use Bayes rule, we have the very clear way to write everything down into probability and then we can sample from the distribution. And that's going to be the translation. So I started reading the statistical machine translation textbooks. And one thing I realized is that the, after the first chapter, they start talking about the reality, <coughs> so the statistical machine translation system in reality, which is super messier than it was promised. So what they do is that they, want, they extract a lot of different features, sometimes up to 300 of them. Some of the features are statistical, some of the features are linguistical, some of the features are just pure add-up things. And then those are based on the, let's say, either statistical theory or the linguistics or whatever you can think of. And then these features are combined using a relatively simple model called log linear model. And they maximize not the probability because this model is not going to define the correct probability after all because they ignore the normalization constant. They maximize some another metric called blue, which is a bit weird metric, but I'll mention it later. And then because their model is very weak, they have to use the very strong language model at the end of the pipeline to filter out the a lot of garbages they get from this model. So it was a super messy picture. And as a machine learning researcher, we thought that, well, it's kind of weird because after all, it's just a supervised learning problem. There's the input and there's the output. So why don't we just replace the whole thing with a single nonlinear model? And since we're doing a neural net, what we want is a just single model that is parametric approximation of the low conditional probability of the target sentence, even the source sentence. And then the whole thing will be trained end to end using the data set available. So this is the first model that we came up with. So it consists of the two recurrent neural nets. That is called encoder, and the other is going to be called decoder. And this looks com very, very complicated, but it's a very simple model. I'll go through it step by step. So first, instead of extracting the weird features from the uh, weird linguistic features, we're going to simply encode each word. So a sentence, we consider it as a sequence of words. Each word as one half vector, or the integer in it. 
So economy is going to be, let's say, index 32 or something like that, and growth something else. So we now have the sequence of binary, uh, binary vectors. And that each of that vector is going to be pro linearly projected into a continuous space. So lower dimensional but continuous vectors. Are we allowed to interrupt? Sorry? Are we allowed to interrupt? Yes. Anytime so, you want, yes. So 1 and k, you, k is the size of your dictionary. Yes. So for English, it's about 100,000? So for the source, we use as large as possible, so usually up to million. Oh, your dictionary is million. Yeah, up to million, right. yes. And target is a bit tricky, but we have some ways to make it larger as well. But I'll, yeah, I'll probably explain it later, because I have some research with that. So we, we get the continuous space representation of our work. And that continuous space representation is going to preserve the meaning or the underlying structure of each word. But again, I gotta emphasize that we do not put any kind of prior knowledge in that. We just tune the whole model, and it's, this continuous space representation will learn to capture the underlying meaning of a word. So now, after this step, we have the sequence of the continuous space word representation. On top of that, we have something called recurrent neural net that reads one word and updates its state based on the previous hidden state and the current word. And it's applied recursively until the end of the sentence is read. So it's a very simple thing. It's just that the function can be anything, essentially. OK, not anything, but there are some choices. But that's not really too important after all. And at the end of the day, what we get is a fixed size representation of a variable length sentence. So we hope, or we assume that this vector is going to be a very nice summarization, a summary of the whole source sentence. And the decoder is just the opposite of what the encoder is. So given this summary, at each time step, decoder is going to update its memory, or the hidden state, from which we compute the distribution over the next word. And once we have the distribution, what we do, we just sample. We sample the next word. And we, essentially, we sample one word at a time until we generate the end of the sentence. And then that's, that should be a translation. This is extremely simple. It is, in fact, very simple. And then even if you write it down as a code, it's like 200 lines of code, and it works. So we didn't expect it to work well, because it was too simple and too naive. But unfortunately, it worked really nicely on English to French translation. So coincidentally, Google was working on the very same model, on the very same problem, independently of us, in the very same time. <laughs> I'm not kidding, very, very same time. And somehow, this, this approach, they made this approach work so well that it was doing better than Google Translate on English French translation. But the unfortunate thing is that it never really worked for us. That model worked for us up to a certain point, but never as well as the Google frame. So I asked them, I, I asked them, you know, like, okay, what's the difference? I emailed the, let's say, the first author of Google's paper, Ilya Suskever. I emailed him, so how is that your model is so great? And my model is not, whereas it's the same structure. It turned out that the, when he, uh, in terms of the number of parameters, their model was about 100 to 200 times larger. And they were using a large workstation with the eight GPUs and using them parallel, which we cannot really afford at the university labs. And they had the amazing software engineers as well. So we started thinking that, okay, if we cannot scale up as Google can, which is true in many cases. So those Google or whatever companies you can think of, they have the resource, they have the people, so it's impossible to actually compete with them in scalability sense. But instead, we have the, so the necessity gives us the, some kind of ideas of it. So we started looking at the model itself, and then tried to analyze what's going on there and what's not going well. And one thing we noticed was that the, whenever the length of the sentence gets longer, the performance of our model just dropped disastrously, whereas their model didn't do that. 
And there could be a lot of different reasons, but one reason that we pinpointed was that it's just impossible to encode the very long sentence into a single vector with a very small model because it's going to be super nonlinear mapping. And in order to learn that, you have to have a super large model. So can we actually, what can we do about this? So we actually tapped into the domain experts. So we talked to the people who are researching human translation. So nobody really knows how humans do translation, obviously. And if, especially you guys will know, because we don't know how brain works. So nobody knows how human translation works as well. But people have worked hard on trying to figure out what are the units of human translation. And what they know is that it's never a whole sentence. No human translator is going to read the source sentence once and then memorize the whole thing and write down the translate, uh, translation, unless the source, source sentence is really short, like two, three words. And then often what human translators do is go back to the source word over and over. And each time they go back and come back to write it, it's often a chunk of two or more words, but never a whole sentence. And that corresponds to kind of a short attention span of humans as well. So we just don't have enough patience to look at the source sentence long enough and memorize it and make the translation that way. We just have to go over back, uh, over and over, go, go back over and over again. So we decided to put this into a model. So we call it neural machine translation with attention. So the change is minimal in encoder. So instead of reading the source sentence in one direction, forward way, now we're going to read the source sentence in a backward direction as well. So, and then we concatenate the hidden state at each location and call it, I'll call it annotation vector. And let's look at what annotation vector does. So this one was the summary of the whole sentence, right? But now, this one is the summary until the slowed, this word. And this one is the summary in a backwards, so the summary of the, all the following words. So this, represent, this represents the slowed, this word, with respect to the whole sentence. So we get the context-dependent word representation, you can think of. And we are not going to use only one of them, but we are going to use the whole thing when we translate. Now, instead of a single vector representation, we have the set of annotation vectors from the encoder, which represent the source sentence. And in the decoder, now a lot of things change. We still sample one word at a time in the translation. But what we do is that each time when we compute the hidden state, we are going to decide on which annotation vector we are going to look at. We are not going to look at everything. So we have another neural net that's going to take as input the previous hidden state, which summarizes what has been translated already, and one of the annotation vectors. And this neural net decides or emits a single scalar that corresponds to how relevant that annotation vector is with respect to what has been translated. And we compute that for every single annotation vector, take the weighted sum, and use that to compute the hidden state. And then this weight is going to be different for every time step, right? And then what happens is that, let's, say, let's think about a very extreme case. So here, in this case, because it has translated la, which is not there, but let's say we did it. And next time step, it needs to look at the growth here. And it's going to put the weight of one here, and then all zeros. Effectively looking only at the growth to translate, uh, to emit the correct translated word cross arm. If my pronunciation is correct. Obviously not, probably. But can, can I ask you if anybody speaks French or German here? Great. I don't speak neither of them either, so it's okay. But, and that, okay, sorry about that. And this model, we hope that if you train this model, at each time step, the decoder is going to look at only a subset of the source. But again, these are all learned. So every single function that we have is parametric function without any kind of prior knowledge. And if there is no corresponding structure in the data, you can actually easily ignore this attention thing and every time step assign the same weight to everything. So that it, can, it just looks at the everything every time, every time step. Right? 
only if there was the corresponding underlying structure in the data is going to utilize this kind of structure. So we devised this model, trained the model on the several different pairs of language, and it turned out that it works really nicely, which is the first evidence that, the, okay, we have the structure that agrees well with what's inside the actual data. So English to French, ours is as good as the, the best system ever so far. English to German, we're doing slightly better than the existing best translation system. Chinese to English on the very informal text, we're doing better than the existing systems. Turkish to English has subtitles, so it's a bit weird data. We're doing, again, better than the existing models. And this is just, you know, like we bring the same model, prepare the four different types of data, we train them without any change in the model, specific for each and any of these pairs. And then it just works. And we just, yes. So the score is higher and better? Or oh yeah, this is the blue score that measures the how many n-grams in the source sentence, uh, reference translation, were generated in the translate, uh, generated by the model. So you're and so it's higher the better. So you're outperforming Google, but you're underperforming TSMT. Um, so we, so in this case, oh, I see. it's all kind of same thing. Is insignificant the difference. Here. So in this case, still kind of insignificant. Is that significantly ours is better? Is also significantly ours is better. And then this is the visualization now. So in that in our model, we had the relevant score for each target word, and we can visualize that. So this was the input, and now here's the actually generated translation from the model. And each time, what happens is that, for instance, let's say it has generated so far love croissant, and then the model computes the relevant score for the every single source word, and this color of the curves called how, how large the relevant score is. And it has correctly spotted that the, okay, now since I have translated love croissant, I need to look at the economy in order to emit the economy. And you can see that this is a perfect translation with the alignments agreeing very well with our intuition. Also, in the case of the English to German, so actually we had this figure, and then I showed it to the statistical machine translation researchers. How cool is this? And they were like, yeah, English to French translation, you know, alignment is so simple, monotonic, and it's also a problem. And I was like, okay, next slide. So how about this, English to German? And he was impressed. Because in German, everything is pretty monotonic, up to, except for the one thing. The verb goes to the end in many cases. And then the, it's not easy for a model to capture it if you have some, any kind of linguistic prior in the model. But because our model doesn't have it, it just learned that the, OK, so I have translated until this point, so head. And then I just skip this part. And then look at the next other ones to generate the corresponding words. And then only at the end, since I have, uh, it has translated everything, this one looks at the verb and then translate. And again, these two on the very same model. So how does the uh, Google model perform on the journal? So they didn't do it themselves. So, oh, okay. <laughs> so it's hard for their model. Yeah, yeah, and their model is huge. So it's almost impossible for us to actually reproduce it. We'll have to spend a lot of time. Yeah. And even funnier thing, so I said, you know, this model is not specific to any type of languages, right? It worked on the different types of the languages. But at the same time, we never did anything specific to language, after all. Now we, we can think of, let's say, images as another language. Like if there's a French, German, Korean, English, and images. And that's what we tried. So it's the very same model, it's a translation model, but we replace the encoder with the so-called convolutional neural net, which I introduced to you earlier, that in 2012, this one effectively crushed all the computer vision community. In fact, they have all com converted, and everyone is using convolutional neural net these days. I'm not kidding, really, every single one of them. And the convolutional neural net gets us the very nice annotation vectors that corresponds to a certain locations in the input image. 
and overlapping so that it has the context of the whole image as well. So we're going to just use this as if these were the annotation vectors from the language encoder we had. And put the same decoder right there to generate the description of an image. So I coded it up in about three days during my Christmas, because in Montreal, Christmas is like super cold, nothing to do. And everyone left for their home. So I coded it up, trained the model, and let me show you some examples of what it can do. So this is the input image. And a zebra standing in a field of tall grass. This is the generated actual description. So the model just generated it. And for each word, as I showed you with the languages, we can actually visualize where the model is paying attention to. So for instance here, zebra. It looks at the zebra. So brighter, the higher the relevance goes. Standing, now it looks at the surrounding areas of the zebra in a field. Now that it has translated the zebra, it doesn't have to look at the zebra, so it doesn't put any kind of relevant score or the attention weight of that. And looks at the surrounding areas and say that in the field of topics. And I can tell you, this segmentation of the segmenting of the foreground object from the background, super difficult computer vision problem, but this one just did it itself. And another example. So input was this image. A stop sign is on a road with a mountain in the background. And you see that when it says stop sign, it correctly spots the stop sign. And again, detecting the traffic sign from an image is a very important research area, and the people have dedicated decades of research on that, until the convolution on Uranus solved it last year. But this model just spotted that there is a stop sign automatically, without any kind of alignment. We didn't give any kind of alignment ourselves. It was all automatic. In 2012, there was a very interesting paper by Mitchell et al. And then they proposed a system called Mitch for generating the description of an image. <coughs> and their system is super complicated. So they extract, they use the, a lot of computer vision algorithms to extract every single possible attribute from an image. And that becomes a huge table for the set. And then they devise an A step NLP algorithm that's going to filter them out and then you know like put them somehow together to get a coherent description. And if you look at their paper, it's just impossible to re-implement. And then the Mitchell went to Microsoft. Now we cannot even get the source code. So it's impossible to reproduce, but I can tell you that this is a very complicated algorithm that they have come up with. But now, in 2015, nowadays, what we do is that we, we show that the, we have a single neural net that's going to take as the input the raw pixels, and then it's going to look at wherever is needed to generate the description, right? And the reason why I put this example is that this is a super interesting example, is that if you look at just the image here, it's almost impossible to distinguish bathing suit and the surfboard. They have the same color. If you run the segmentation algorithm based on the super pixels, it's going to be just merged together, and then as a one thing. But our model was able to correctly spot that, okay, there is a surfboard. And that's pretty awesome. Well, gender recognition is also impressive. Yes. So in fact, what we noticed was that the, when our model, at the beginning of the training, so in the middle of the training, the model makes a lot of mistakes about the gender, especially of the babies, because, you know, like, in fact, I couldn't even tell well whether it's a girl or a boy. They're like three or four year old running on the beach. It's impossible. But if it's trained well enough, it actually correctly recognizes the gender as well. So the question is, how does this single neural net do whatever the Michel had to spend a lot of time to make that algorithm to do? How does it do it? And the better question is, what kind of structure has this neural net found from the data? And again, we never really gave any kind of explicit alignment. So it just had to extract it from the data itself. Oops. Sorry about that. So, and I think now it's time to go to the future. I think one of the future is in the using deep learning for the data science. And obviously, if you talk to anybody, 
uh, if you talk to like anybody on data science, nobody knows what data science is. That's a big problem. I spent about six hours trying to find this one definition that was at least non not nonsense. So data science, according to Basantar of NYU, data science is the study of the generalized of extraction of knowledge from data. So the data science aims at extracting the underlying structures that we couldn't have done ourselves by using the algorithmic techniques. And I believe one of the interesting areas in data science is the neuroscience and computational neuroscience. This is a paper from the CMU last year. I didn't really read the paper carefully. It was so complicated and convoluted. Writing was pretty convoluted, but this figure was really nice. So what they did was that they measured the fMRI and MEG, or they tried like multiple things, and I'm not sure which one is this figure. Sergey, can you actually tell? Probably me? fMRI. Okay, fMRI. They measured the fMRI while showing each subject a sentence from Harry Potter, book three or something like that. And then what they did was to extract the linguistic features from each word in the sentence, and then they tried to find the correspondence between certain linguistic features and the spatial temporal activity on the brain. And they had to use a lot of complicated feature extraction here, there, and then you know, how to find the mapping here. But they showed some interesting things. But when I looked at this figure, what I find most interesting is not what they, uh, how they did, but what this problem actually looks like. This is just, we have this source sentence and then target sentence. It's effectively a translation problem. So what would happen if we put our translation model, which worked on the image as well, on top of this data set? And our model was able to find the alignment pretty nicely. So will it be able to find the alignment between the word with respect to the context, so word in a sentence, to the certain spatial temporal locations in the brain's activities? And furthermore, our model was very robust in a sense that we didn't have to give any kind of explicit alignment. And it's, it works really nicely even if you make some grammatic error in the source sentence. In other words, it's very robust to the different time scales or the wrong steps or something like that. So then, can we actually now do the multi-subject neuroscience more easily? Say you measure the brain signals or the activities from two subjects with, let's say, a bit of clumsy job of synchronizing effort, which should be really difficult as well, I guess. Then now we want to just train a model train the neural net to model the joint distribution over those two sequences, or the n sequences. There was never a constraint that it has to be two sequences. And then will it actually be able to align the brain measurements from multiple subjects automatically? I don't know, but I think we should try, definitely. And then by doing that, can we actually learn about how higher level cognition functions that require the social interactions work? So that's a super future, but I think that's the right way to go. And ultimately, as a machine learning and deep learning researcher, what I want is to build a general computation model of everything, of course. Neuroscience, all right, fun, language, fun, but really fun thing is to actually make a single model that's going to take as the input every single thing. Brain measurements, natural language text, weather data, movies, images, social nets, whatever you can think of. And then the nice thing is that the, no single scientist can find the correspondence between these many modalities using that large data. But this model can find them. These machine learning models can find the correspondence or the relationship among these mo modalities. And now this arrow goes like the other way as well. So by looking at this model, trained model, we can actually learn something about the uh, natural phenomena as well, in a much more holistic way. But unfortunately, deep learning has not been so good. And that's why I cannot retire today or tomorrow. There are a lot of challenges. And one of the challenges to how to model much longer sequence. So our model works amazingly on sentence level, which is usually a sequence of up to 100 or 200 words. And on the paragraph, it also works pretty well, up to three, 800,000 words. 
but on the document, it just breaks down. We just don't even have a nice, efficient way to train the model. And if I push it a bit further, like in a, the whole genome sequence of a person, it's going to be a super long sequence. And I have no idea how I can train my recurrent neural net on this kind of data. And at the same time, language, the nice thing about language is that it's the one dimensional grammar. But can we actually do it on a much higher resolution, high dimensional data as well? Like think about the Blu-ray. It has a, it's a very long sequence of the very high dimensional images or the frames. And we still cannot train our model on this, although many people started tackling this. And, is that is it informative? Yeah, it's high resolution, but is it all informative? Then? So in order to know that, we need to be able to start training the model, but we don't have the, even the efficient way to train the model. So we're like stuck at the end of like, We don't even know how informative that is, and how can we extract the information, lower dimensional ones, but we don't have the way to do that. And also, it's the, whatever I told you today has been largely been constrained, confined to the supervised learning. But supervised learning is only a fraction of the, a lot of interesting problems that we want to solve. So ultimately what we want is a human brain-like model that, that uh, where this single model is going to do the perception of the environment and understand the perception, uh, under, have understanding of the environment based on the perception based on which it makes the action to the environment. And you once in a while get the reward from the far away in time or space. But this one is really difficult. First of all, the reward comes too far away from time. As an example, you cannot raise your baby with the reward of getting a PhD in machine learning. The signal is too weak. You cannot raise a baby there with that. But somehow humans do that. And it's probably the exploitation of the vast amount of unpaired. So unpaired is in no parent reward. And unlabeled data. Unlabeled data is no teacher giving you the correct answer. So this, is, this must help in this whole loop of the reinforcement learning. But I don't think we have a very nice way to exploit that yet. Many people are working on it, and, but not, not far from it yet. And this is a bit list of the embarrassing questions that I have no answer to, or a lot of people do not have answer to. And people have, we have to really work on it, is that it, we don't even know the capacity of the neural nets that we train. We somehow train it, we know it's awesome, but we don't know how awesome it is. So which class of functions can give neural nets approximately better than the shallow ones? We don't know that. Especially the deep neural net that we use. Not the, okay, binary circuits, if you view it as a networks and you know, like do something, of course, deeper the better because you, you get the exponential gain. But in the continuous variable case, like the ones that we use, we don't really know them. And if, did it, if there is a class like that, then how much better can deep networks approximate the class? We don't know. How much do we gain by increasing the depth of a network? We don't know. This is really embarrassing that we don't know the answer to this one. And another embarrassing thing is that we don't even know how the cost, how does the cost function that we minimize look like. We somehow minimize it very well. We know how to do it really well, but we don't know how it looks like. It's a billion dimensional non-convex function. That's the only thing we know. But somehow we can minimize it, but we don't know what that is. And what kind of like the structural change in the network, uh, like, have consequence on the cost function that we don't know yet. And for the unsupervised learning, even more embarrassing thing is that we don't even know what is the correct objective function that we need to either minimize or maximize. This is embarrassing, but we are still using the unsupervised learning, but we don't know if that is the correct way of doing the unsupervised learning. And there are so many more questions to be answered, but I'll work on that, you use it. That's the idea. And these are the list of the people that I collaborated with or worked together with. A lot of people, but still I did some work as well, so please acknowledge that as well. But yeah, it's been really amazing working with all these people. And if you want to work with me as well, just email me. I'm always available.